a privilege to have this opportunity to share with you ideas about where we are and where we're going in America. And now that's going to be a particularly difficult thing today and in today's America because there's so much happening. So what I'm going to try to do is just generally touch on some principles and some points and then rely on you in the question and answer period to give your traditionally cogent and sometimes trenchant questions. Um, and that will, that will sharpen our focus. I, I'm not going to try to give you a convention type speech. This isn't the place for that. Uh, the 92nd Street Y, and this isn't the time for it. Uh, I said a long time ago, talking about politics and subjects like the ones we're going to talk about this evening, that you know, in, in politics, in government, one campaigns in poetry, but then you have to govern in prose. And that's very true. And what I want to talk to you about today is governing in prose. Uh, where are we? Well, Iraq is, as you just heard, the dominant issue. You're going to be hearing Mr. Ricks and others here at the 92nd Street Y, and that is the big issue at the moment, but it's by no means the only big issue. We're still the strongest nation in world history, there's no question about that, whose ten generations of seekers and strugglers from other lands and their offspring have enjoyed a success that they probably wouldn't have been able to enjoy in the place that they came from. As so we're the greatest nation in world history, there's no doubt of it. In the last six years, however, our progress upward has been stalled dramatically. Now think about it, just six years ago, in 2000, the Clinton administration had left behind, because it was over in 2000, a nation that was at peace, that had just experienced eight years of economic growth, the 16 strongest stock market quarters in our history, the creation of 22 million new jobs, the accomplishment of a balanced budget, an upwardly mobile middle class. Middle class people were actually doing better and better every year. And a shrinking poor population, And the, as it should be in a country that's continuously getting richer, you should have fewer poor people. And that's what was happening in the years that ended in 2000. We were ready to move up further at that point, further up the mountain toward the uh, wonderful notion of a shining city on a hill. What's happened since then? Well, instead of going upward, we have slid backwards, and dramatically so. We've experienced 9-11, of course, terrorism, the war in Afghanistan, our ill-advised invasion and then occupation of Iraq, the government's shameful failure after Hurricane Katrina, the whipsaw effect of exorbitant spending and huge tax cuts, some of which were clearly gratuitous. And they have left us debt-ridden, mired in a war we didn't need, less respected around the world, divided at home by a widening gap between the lucky and the left out, and confused about what to do, what precisely to do next. Measured by traditional econometrics, we're told the government, the economy is growing, and it is indeed growing. But what those econometrics don't tell us is that much of the growth is overseas and not here. And while our economy has been wonderfully rewarding for high-level corporate executives and big stockholders, it has not been so for most other Americans. Now, when I was working up my way up the ladder years ago, and some of you, I'm sure, experienced it with me, workers looked forward to annual wage increases. Every year, you felt and knew that you'd do better than the year before, and you certainly knew that you would do better than your parents had. That was the upward movement of the middle class. Well, that has stopped cold. Today, the median hourly wage for American workers has declined 2% 2 since 2003. Most American workers are falling behind in part because in this increasingly high-scale global economy, only one in four of our workers is high-skilled. High-skilled is equivalent of four years of education after high school. Only one in four workers is high-skilled in this super-rich 
powerful, the most powerful nation in the world. Two-thirds of our American teenagers, only two-thirds, graduate high school. Only two-thirds of our high school students graduate. American employers are importing thousands of skilled workers from other countries, or they're outsourcing work to nations like Ireland, India, and China, which produce more skilled workers than they used to, and in some cases more than we do. At the same time, the income of most working Americans, now they, we refer to them as the middle class. Let me give you my definition of the middle class. The middle class are people who work for a living because they have to, not because a psychiatrist told them it's a good way to fill the grim interval between birth and eternity. You know, they work because they have to. And that means that you know, if you live in Manhattan and you're lucky enough to be married with children, uh, you know, you might be making $200,000 a year and losing. You might be going backwards. So the middle class are people who work because they have to. Well, those people overwhelmingly are falling behind because they can't keep up with the cost of things that they need, all the things they need, most of all health care. Health care for a while was going up double digits, and their salaries weren't going up at all or very little. Health care, transportation, education, retirement security, um, housing, energy, all these things are going up. Your income isn't, you're sliding backward. And further down the ladder, behind them economically in this richest nation in world history, we're lucky enough to have more millionaires and billionaires than ever, incidentally. There we're doing very well. And that's a good thing, that's not a bad thing. I remember my mother asking me who Lee Iacocca was once, and I explained who he was and, uh, and how he got very, very rich. And she said, really, how, how did he get rich? I said, well, you know, he's in Christ that makes these automobiles. And she says, what's the matter, you couldn't learn how to make an automobile? I, <laughs> so this, you know, she, they didn't come here to be happy middle class or struggling poor. They came here to be Lee Iacocca. And uh, I never quite made it, but, but and Mama was not happy about that. And so having millionaires and billionaires is a very good thing. The difficulty is you know, when you do that but fail to bring other people from the bottom up a few rungs in the process. And what's happened is the poor population, listen to this, the poor population is growing larger in the United States over the last five years. Now 37 million people over, we have perhaps, what, 300, 310 million now. And 37 million are poor. 13 million of them are children. And most of those children are said to be at risk of poverty, illiteracy, and abuse. I used a line that that is so meaningful to me, I use it over and over. And a lot of them come from neighborhoods like my old neighborhood, South Jamaica, Queens, where they grow up surrounded by all kinds of disorientation. And some of them grow up familiar with the sound of gunfire before they've ever heard an orchestra play. That's the literal truth. And that's in this richest, most powerful nation. And incidentally, you're not going to hear a lot about that. Edwards is talking about it, but e even that uh, probably will slow down because the politics of it is you don't win by talking about the poor people, regrettably. You know, they don't vote, they don't have money for campaigns, and, and as a matter of fact, even some liberals are shy about making the case for the, for the poor people because they, it designates you as a kind of mushy-headed type. And uh, that's unfortunate. And so all of that has happened since 2000. Now this lack of proportionality and apparent unfairness in the United States have confused and frightened and angered many Americans. Indeed, all the Democrats needed to do in 2006 to win power in the Congress, which they did, was point to the to the list of failures by the Republicans. Things went so awry that they have dominated now the Congress without ever even coming forward to the American people and saying, here's what we're going to do specifically that's better than what they did. 
People are just so unhappy about what they did and are doing that they said, look, we're finished with them. We're going to give you an opportunity. It's a kind of the seesaw effect in politics. See, if you think of politics as the Republican President Bush is on one side and the Democrats are on the other side, if the weight of his ineptitude or his errors you know, drives his side of the seesaw down, your side goes up and you're looking down at him and that makes you feel very good. But you can fool yourself into thinking you got up by your own power. You didn't. You got up because he went down. And if he hadn't gone down, you would have been down. Now, now well, they don't think about that. All they think about is they won. I think about how they won, and how they won was by the other guys losing. And that leaves you in a position where, well, maybe you can do that again in 2008, and you can make a president that way. No chance for that. No chance for that, because in the, the party's over, basically, for the Democrats for the moment. The election in 2008 is going to be an entirely different thing. After years of chaos in Iraq, which have led to the neglect of many of our critical domestic issues, voters are looking for dramatic ideas and courageous leadership to deal with the nation's most difficult challenges. They want to see if the Democrats can do what the Republicans could not. And Democrats know that, and that's why they started with such fierce energy. Nancy Pelosi in the House, you know, first woman ever to be Speaker, a wonderful step forward. And uh, good news for Hillary, too, because it doesn't hurt for Hillary who's running for president to be following the first woman speaker in the United States, which gave people a chance to, to, to feel good about progress in this country. Uh, even, even we insensitive males had to feel good about the notion that, well, finally, women were achieving the kind of power and influence they've always de uh, deserved. Well, led by her, there was this terrific burst of energy called the uh, 100 Hours of Progress. And it was a good thing. Um, they passed bills on increasing the minimum wage, a very good thing, especially for poor workers. Embryon and there are a lot of poor workers. Embryonic stem cell research, a good thing. Health care benefits, national security, education, energy, all laudable, laudable areas and good things to do. Uh, it's not likely that all of those bills, or more than one or two of them, will actually be passed by the Senate and then signed by the President. But the point is, the Democrats wanted to uh, indicate that they were going to go at this thing with a high degree of commitment, and that's good. But those issues, good as they are, aren't good enough to keep them in power in 2008, and certainly not good enough to win a president. So there's a long, hard road if, of, for the Democrats if they're going to be able to keep control and to elect the president. Because for that to happen, to happen, Democrats will eventually need to deal with our biggest and most serious issues. And I'm going to give you a few of what I think are the most daunting of those issues. But let me say before that, I think the one thing that will characterize, and I pray that this is so, the one thing that will characterize the elections in 2008 will be issues. I don't expect to see the country vote for somebody because they've been seduced by his or her charisma or his or her sex or, or religion or geography. I don't think those things are going to make uh, the next president. They're, they'll help if you have uh, a, a cluster of those good characteristics. But in the end, it's going to be, what are you going to do on the big issues? Because we have big issues, like this middle-class unhappiness, and like Iraq, which we have to start with, and terrorism, which you'll have to deal with after you deal with Iraq, because Iraq is not the war on terrorism. Iraq became a war on terrorism because you attacked Iraq and drew terrorists there. But once you get out of Iraq, good Lord willing, as soon as possible, you're going to be left with the war on terrorism. And then you have energy, and you have immigration, and you have all sorts of other things. So let's quickly, very quickly, Iraq, for example. You're going to hear from Ricks, who's terrific. And um, you're going to hear all about the books like Fiasco and Out of Iraq and, and the, the books on, on, by Joe Biden's plan and uh, things like that if you come to the next lecture. But let's say for now at least the following. 
an overwhelming majority of Americans, an overwhelming majority of our European allies uh, think the president is wrong in his newest plan, which is to uh, send another 21,000 American soldiers into Iraq, 7,000 of them into Baghdad, where six million Iraqis are desperately trying to survive chaos. The president once again claims that these forces will end that chaos and will eventually replace it with a strong new Iraqi government that will bring a degree of sanity and regularity to, uh, to the terrible situation there, a degree of sanity that will allow us to declare victory for the United States. But we remember that he did declare victory three years ago on the Abraham Lincoln. And uh, we remember that uh, he was wrong when he did that. And we remember that he's been wrong about almost all the big issues where Iraq is concerned. He certainly was wrong about the weapons of mass destruction, how our forces would be greeted by Iraqis as liberators instead of occupiers, how fierce the insurgency would be, how many troops we would need, how much it would cost, how long it would take, how receptive the Iraqis would be to our brand of democracy. Very big mistake. They don't know anything about democracy. And if you look even at the Constitution, which everybody appeared to cheer when it was adopted, it's more like our Articles of Confederation than our um, Constitution. It actually sets up three groups that have their own foreign policy, the Shia, the Sunni, and the Kurds. It's more like the Articles of Confederation than the Constitution. And it allowed for Sharia. It allowed for religious law. Our Constitution does exactly the opposite. And one of the things we did most significantly and of such profound importance was saying we will not allow ourselves to be ruled by a particular religion. We will allow everybody to have their own religion as long as they don't hurt people with it <clears throat> or hurt their children with it. A Christian scientists, et cetera, et cetera, and judgments were made that, well, no, you have to allow for surgery, even if your religion says no, things like that. And so, so he was wrong about all these things, and that makes it very easy for the Democrats and others to say now he must be wrong about this plan. And uh, that's, that's logical and acceptable, I think, except in order uh, to prove that Democrats can do what Republicans could not, which is our burden as Democrats, Democrats have to offer more than a rejection of the president's plan. I mean, I don't think it's enough, frankly, for Democrats, and I'm a Democrat and a, and a proud one, to say, well, we believe in a what do you believe in? Well, we believe in withdrawal. Terrific. We all believe in withdrawal. What kind of withdrawal? A cautious withdrawal. Oh, good. We believe in that, too. Uh, how do you do it? Well, you do it slowly, slowly. Oh, wonderful. And so that's your plan? Yes, cautious withdrawal. Wonderful. It's not a plan. Uh, and there, there are plans. Now, there's a book, and I'm astonished that this has not achieved more popularity uh, than it has, Out of Iraq, which I recommend to all of you. Out of Iraq, a practical plan for withdrawal now from Iraq. And the, the principal writer of the book was a man by the name of Polk, who for half a century has been studying Iraq. And he refers to all kinds of possibilities for an alternate plan to the president's. And, and one possibility is the one mentioned by Joe Biden, which is, look, since the Constitution you've adopted there already seems to create three different entities with a central uh, over-government, uh, maybe you should partition Shia, Sunni, they're the ones who have been killing one another for hundreds and hundreds of years. Maybe, maybe you should give them a certain degree of independence, plus the Kurds that doesn't like either of them and is looking for its own uh, nation, but that makes the Turks unhappy. But maybe we should partition it with overall government saying one thing we will do certainly overall, and that is apportion the Revenues from oil, which is the lifeblood of any Iraqi economy, you know, apportion that centrally so that the Shias, which live in the place where most of the oil is, uh, wouldn't have most of the revenues, and you'd do it on some fair basis. Well, that's, that's one idea that the, the book talks about. They talk about things that you'd have to do to have an intelligent plan. What about reconstruction? When you withdraw, who's going to build the place? 
Who's going to rebuild the place? Who's going to take care of all the things you've destroyed, like the absolute essential water supply and the rest of the infrastructure? Um, what are you going to do about the 14 bases you have there? How do you rebuild those bases? Uh, how do you get the Shia and the Sunni to talk to one another? Uh, how do you avoid chaos when you're withdrawing? Uh, now, Sadr, and you read in today's paper that that army, uh, the Shia army that uh, was so eager to drive us out, now are saying, look, we'll, we'll take a pass. We'll stand back until the Americans get out. But we want a date for when they get out. Well, how do you avoid, as soon as the Americans get out, them coming in and starting to slash away at the Sunnis, et cetera, et cetera? What do you do about that? Well, there's an idea, um, uh, Big New Brzezinski and many others have done this, but it's in the book, and you'll hear about it if you come to hear them speak here, I'm sure. There is an idea of putting together a force of Arab and Muslims in the area, which will serve the way it has in the Baltics and in other places, to come in behind the Americans and to help the Iraqis, by tr helping to train their troops, which is what the Americans are doing, and helping to keep peace for a while. Because it's not going to come by magic just because you leave. What we're afraid of and what the president's plan uh, insists is the first predicate is that when you leave, if you don't do anything else, there'll be chaos again and we'll pay for the chaos one way or another. Well, all of those ideas are available. The Democrats should put them all into one plan and in an ideal world, which we're not in, the Democrats would get everybody to agree. Nancy and Harry Reid, all the candidates, Obama and Edwards and Hillary Clinton and, uh, and everybody in the race, you'd get them and the National Democrats to sit down and say, here's our plan and we're going to do it by consensus. Here's the Democratic view. That would be a miracle, but we should try, the, we should try for miracles and come as close as we can. Now, then, after that, you're stuck with terrorism. Now you've, you've cleaned up Iraq, and let's, good Lord willing, you'd get that done by 2008, I doubt it, but let's assume that you did. You'd still have terrorism, and there we're not doing well. The terrorism's in Afghanistan, the Taliban are beginning to win. The terrorism is all over the world, and the terrorism is not like fighting a war, we keep calling it a war, but that, that can delude you into thinking it's really a war like the Second World War, like you're fighting Nazi troopers. You're not. They're different. The enemy we're now facing is a fanatical, delusional ideology. You're fighting an idea. It's in part religious, in part cultural, in part historical. And the religious aspect is a distortion of the Islamic religion that would encourage murder of non-believers, so-called infidels, by promising a reward of eternal glory. Today, these fanatical jihadists are scattered all through the Middle East and far beyond. And they're scattered by you know, being sprinkled among millions of human beings around them, and they're hidden by them because they don't wear uniforms, they don't have a single leader, and they can be found, especially in the poverty-afflicted areas of the Middle East, but also in Great Britain, throughout Europe, Africa, India, in Indonesia, Canada, and the United States of America. And they're significant, but they are a very small part, and this is important to, uh, to remember, of the world's one billion or more Muslims, most of whom deplore jihadist fanaticism and their destructive terrorist tactics deplore it, especially because of the stigma effect it has on the rest of them. And that's important. We should have in that one billion Muslim population many people who agree with us, and we should find ways to use them the way we should find people in Iran and people in Syria who agree with us to be a more effective force on our side of the argument. Now, in this war against terrorist ideology, collaboration with our allies, and negotiation with our enemies when appropriate are vital. This is not a war you can win by dropping bombs. We won the Second World War with atom bombs. They were very effective. They killed 400,000 people, and they ended the war. And we should argue about that one until we're through as a nation. But you can't do that here. You can't win just with military action. You'll need military action as we need it in Afghanistan. 
but you'll have to do negotiation. You'll have to do other things. The Saudis are paying money to madrasas that are teaching children to become jihadists and kill the Jews and the Christians. Why are we talking to the Saudi Arabians about that? Why don't we stop them? Why don't we say, why are you paying them to do this? Well, why don't we do a lot of things where Saudi Arabia is concerned? Why aren't we giving money to the Millennium Challenge and Arab Partnership? Oh, you never heard of those programs, I'll bet. The Millennium Challenge and the Arab Partnership. They were basically Colin Powell's ideas before he left. He was Secretary of State. Bush bought them. And if you look at the defense strategy of 2002, every year we have to file, the President has to file a defense strategy. And he tells you what he intends to do to defend this country against enemies. And in 2002, it talked about preemptory uh, uh, war and the possibility of that, preempting, going first before they have a chance to attack you because you know they're going to attack you. But in that same package, he said a lot of this jihadism comes from places that are particularly vulnerable because the people are poor. And so we should give them economic assistance, not just because it's a, pa it's a compassionate thing to do, but because it's a smart thing to do. It's a smart thing to do in South Jamaica, Queens, too. It's a smart place to do in all the ghettos of the United States or anywhere. And it's not because if you're poor, you're going to be bad. It's because if you're poor, you're going to be tempted and you're going to be vulnerable to people who come and say, hey, look, there's an easier way. These people don't like you or you wouldn't be poor. So here's what we ought to do. And so, so you have to do some of that in the war of, uh, uh, against terrorism. And also we have to do something about Israel. And this may be the hardest piece of all. You have to do something about Israel. Now, the most distressing part of the recent fighting in Lebanon, as far as I was concerned, was, not the, was that the basic rationale of Hezbollah was not the grievance concerning the bombing by Israel in, in response to seizure by the uh, Hezbollah of Israeli soldiers. It was much more fundamental and much more distressing. The Hezbollah rationale, it seems to me, like Hamas, Hamas's rationale was and remains this. This is their basic proposition. Israel has no right to exist on a nation, as a nation on any of the lands it now occupies and must therefore be destroyed, period. That's what they believe. Well, how do you negotiate with people who start that way? You can't. I mean, that's where they start, and if they stay with that proposition, you can't negotiate. There is no second step, except, you know, to get to the point where you say, well, now, that's your position now. What do I have to do to make you change that position? Uh, and, and that we haven't done well. And as a matter of fact, we haven't done anything for six years. President Bush talked in the first part of his presidency about, I have a plan. And if you look closely at it, and I said this at the time, but not a lot of other people did, uh, I think most people like this plan. He says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a, a Palestine, and we're going to have an Israel, and two nations side by side. They're going to work together. But here's what you have to do first. First, get Arafat to say we should live, we Israelis. Then, two, stop terrorism. And then, three, when you've got Arafat to say that, and you've stopped terrorism, call us up, and we'll come, and we'll make a plan. And what I said is he's trying to buy time to get out of the first term into the second term without doing anything about Israel. And that's exactly what happened. He did nothing about Israel. And we've done nothing for six years. Well, we have to find a way to restart the process that could begin. Maybe I talked to Brzezinski about this one day. I just bumped into him. And uh, we were chatting. And, and maybe the, the way you start it is you go to the Arab League that said a few years ago that, hey, look, maybe that first proposition we should reconsider. And maybe we should talk about, uh, yes, we accept uh, Israel's ability to uh, live as a nation in peace, uh, conditioned upon this. Now, we get them to say that to start the process. But however we do it, we have to start the process. And we have to talk to the Syrians and we have to talk to the Iranians. And, and I'm not saying we should go and, and start negotiating heavily, but you should be in touch, you should be discussing. You should not take off the table any of the really unpleasant remedies. You shouldn't start by saying, look, we will never attack you. You can't say that. 
because even if you intend never to attack them, you shouldn't say, we'll never attack you. You should at least make them wonder whether or not you will do to us what you did to the Iraqis, because that's useful to you in negotiation. But then you should sit and talk with them. There are some signs, as you've seen, that the Iranians, uh, uh, Ahmad Dinejad is not doing as well this week as he has been doing regularly, but they're getting a little bit nervous about his, his uh, crude, primitively crude kind of approach to all of this, so there may be a chance there. That's Iraq, that's terrorism, energy. In a nutshell, the energy crisis. You know, some years ago, 1962, President Kennedy came to the United States of America uh, and said to them, listen, I'm not going to talk to you about money. I'm not going to tell you where we'll get the money. I'm not going to tell you how we're going to do it, but we must be the first people in space because if not, we're not, then the Soviets may be, and if the Soviets get there before we do, that's very bad for us, and he convinced America. He didn't show them a budget. He didn't show them anything else. He didn't talk about recession slowing us down. He just said, this is important for America. We must be the first in space. And just on the strength of his powerful oratory and his powerful logic, a very simple logic, but a po powerful logic, ever since then, we have every year spent billions of year, uh, dollars on space without a challenge. There's never a big argument about it. When's the last time you even heard about it? I think we averaged something like $19 billion a year because it became part of our political culture. He convinced us we needed to be, and we were first in space, and we have had phenomenal production as a result of that. It's led to all kinds of good things. And sometimes we wonder about that, and occasionally you hear people saying, well, why do we do it? But overall, we are accepting uh, approval, uh, approving it and accepting it and profiting from it. That's what you have to do on energy. Energy is more important to us now, alternative energy, as a nation, than space was in 1962. So if, if it was true then, it's true now. If you had a leader like Kennedy who could stand up and say, look, oil, we depend upon oil. They wrote a book in 1974 called Energy Future. It came out of Harlem. Uh, Harlem, uh, hardly. Harvard, there is a difference. <laughs> it came out of Harvard. Uh, but there were smart enough people in Harlem, too, if you had given them the education that you gave them in uh, Harvard. Well, in Harlem, they might have written the book. And what it said was, you need an alternative, because a lot of this stuff comes from the Middle East. And it makes you a slave to them when it comes to foreign policy, at least to some extent. It gives them an edge on you. And a lot of people are getting rich in oil. But you should have alternatives to it because it is too dominant a source for us. Now that expression ought to be, that, that ought to be done. Uh, it ought to be done by the Democrats. The Republicans talk about it all, all the time but never do it because they're very heavily oil invested. There are all kinds of alternatives. I'm not going to get into nuclear energy, which is a subject I know a lot about because of the Shoreham facility and because New York State has nuclear power. But, but uh, there are three big problems with nuclear. And if you could solve those, you'd it'd be a giant step forward. One is the technology needs uh, addressing because um, the Chernobyl effect is still in people's minds. And that happened because the technology was off. But that's just technology. Also, siting is a problem. They tried to build Shoreham on Long Island in a place where you can't get home from the beach on a Saturday. So what happens if the bell goes off and says, whoops, we had an explosion? And, and so they told me, well, don't worry about that. We'll count on no explosions. I said, well, that doesn't make sense. So we didn't allow Shoreham. And so siting is a problem. You have to find a right place for it. And then what do you do with this stuff? How do you get rid of it? Well, here's... Here's a surprise for you. None of you even knew this. They loaded the plant with nuclear fuel at Shoreham. It was loaded with that explosive stuff. And President Bush, the first President Bush, told me he was going to do it. And we discussed it with him and John Sununu. You remember him? An old friend of ours from Queens, actually. John was from Queens. And he said, we're going to load it. And I said, but it'll never operate. He said, we're going to load it. So they loaded it, and it never operated. Well, what happened to the stuff? We got it off the island. Where is it? I'm not going to tell you. All I am going to tell you is you can get rid of the stuff. Just 
go look for it in Shoreham, and you won't find it. Why? Because we got rid of it. So that can be handled. And it, like all technological problems can be handled. Uh, there's a lot more to energy, but that should be a very, very big issue. And then there's the middle class to deal with, and what they need is education, what they need is health care, what they need is more skilled workers here, what they need is more intelligent trade policy, so that it's not, uh, so not just because you're trading with another country, uh, that's good to do and, and stop there. Well, there are all kinds of ways to trade, and there's, free, there's no such thing as absolutely free trade. But we can make a fairer kind of trade. You know, remember NAFTA, North American, free trade? Okay. NAFTA dealt with both Canada and Mexico. The part that we signed up with Canada was perfect. Why? Because it was compatibility. Because they're like us. Because they treat workers a little bit more the way we do. The problem with Mexico was there was no compatibility. Their environmental regulations were nil. They had no respect for the, the workers compared to us. And so I, I believe, was the only governor in the United States of America to be against NAFTA. And President Clinton asked me why, and I told him, because of that. The part that deals with Canada is perfect, but not with Mexico. It was easier to make a fair deal with Canada. We didn't make a fair one with Mexico, and I don't think it worked out well. I think we've lost more than we've gained from that part of the deal. And so, you, you, but, but we need more education. Everybody should have a college education. In an ideal world, that would happen. But how do you do all of this? Big question for the Democrats. And this maybe is one of the more important things that I have to say to you. Uh, a lot of the politicians will be stymied. They'll say, gee, Mario, I agree with you on energy. That's a terrific idea. And you're right, education, 47 million people are doing without health insurance. We have to do something about that. 80% of the 47 million people who don't have health insurance are workers. Now, what does it mean not to have health insurance? Here's what it means. You're a woman. You're, 20, uh, you're making $26,000, $27,000 a year. You're an itinerant secretary. You're a single parent. You have a 14-year-old boy, and you have an 18-year-old girl who they want to accept at Princeton, but you have to come up with some money. You have no health insurance. Why? You can't afford it. You live in Manhattan. It would cost $10,000 for the policy. You're, you, you make just something less than $30,000. You, you simply can't afford it. You're one of the 47 million people without health insurance. Not old enough for Medicare, not poor enough for Medicaid. You get breast cancer. Well, uh, well how do you deal with that? Isn't that expensive? It certainly is expensive if you're going to have an operation, one breast, two breasts. It certainly is expensive. And you'll get the operation because nobody goes without the health care. One way or another, you'll get it from a hospital. But they'll have to pay for it somehow, and that's, that's the problem. And you might wind up bankrupt. And if you're bankrupt, that, that limits you. And if you live, good Lord, willing, that limits you in a lot of ways. Well, well, well why should that be? Why should it be that a woman who's working hard as a single parent who has a wonderful opportunity for her daughter but now is going to be bankrupted and reduced and, and her, her, her future is going to be jeopardized by virtue of the bankruptcy? Why? We're the richest country in the world. We have more billionaires and millionaires this year than we had last year and the year before. We're on our way to the first trillionaire. Why is it that you can't provide more health insurance? Well, that's a big problem. Well, because it costs money and because we don't want to go anywhere near it. Uh, Hillary tried it and the president tried it in uh, 1994 and uh, the insurance companies convinced us it's too expensive. So the hell with it. We'll do without it. That can't be right. It can't be right. Why is it that only one out of four of our workers are, are high skilled? Why, why don't they all go to college? Why did you make public schools to the eighth grade free? Well, because we, we decided for the good of the country that it needs to be a certain minimum level of education. Great. That minimum level now is college at least. So why didn't you make that free? We can't afford it. But you gave the biggest tax cuts in American history, and a big part of them went to the top 1%. 
Those are the billionaires, millionaires, and people over $400,000 a year. What was your rationale for giving all that money away, billions of dollars over the next decade? Why did you do that? Well, we need that. Why did you need it? It's good for the economy. Why is it good for the economy? Those people invest the money. Are you kidding me or what? They invest the money. We have more investment money sitting around, you know, dying looking for a deal. They don't invest the money. They, you know, they, if they do invest the money, good for them, but we're not short of investment money. We didn't have to give it to them. And you yourself, Mr. President, when you gave it, gave a different rationale. You said, this is their, not our money, it's their money, and we don't need it. And you didn't need it because Clinton had left you with a $5.4 trillion surplus. And so you said, we don't need the money, and you gave it all back. Sorry, Mr. President. We don't have a surplus. We now have the largest deficit in American history and the largest debt in American history. And so where is your rationale for that tax cut? Why don't we take it back? Oh, you can't take it back. Why can't you take it back? Because if you try taking it back, they'll call that a tax increase. And then they'll say, you mushy-headed liberals, that's all you do is tax increases. And that's what they did to Mondale. Okay, now let me tell you the Mondale story. Let me try to do it in a hurry because I'm already taking too much of your time for the question period. Here's what happened in 1984. Mondale said you're going to have to raise taxes because President Reagan's tax cut program uh, and spending program is going to be so huge, it's going to leave us with a big deficit in debt, and you're going to have to raise taxes and reduce spending. And everybody said, boo, we're not going to vote for you. You want to raise taxes. And that's it. He lost. Reagan won. He was right. How do you know he was right? Well, Reagan did cut taxes dramatically in the percentages of income most significantly. And that was a very good thing to do because it was very high, it was too high, so was New York's. It was a good idea to cut New York's tax, income tax as well. That was a very good thing to do. But he cut them, th those rates so severely and spent so much money, particularly on the military budget, that it produced the biggest deficit in debt in American history as of that time. We have a new record with the current Republican president. And then what happened? Well, even Reagan had to admit that the deficit and debt was a big problem. How did he solve it? He raised taxes. On whom? On the richest people in America. For how much? About $100 billion. Oh, I didn't know that. No, nobody knows that. I knew it because I was the governor of the state of New York, and I was arguing, and I was chairman of the National um, governor's conference on budgets and I went to see President Reagan and I talked to Vice President Bush and I reminded Vice President Bush that he had said to President Reagan when he was trying to be president and they were both running for president that President Reagan's then candidate Reagan's idea of the magic of supply side which is you can spend money spend money spend money and then cut taxes, cut taxes, cut taxes, and then still balance the budget through the magic of supply side. What's the magic of supply side? That once you cut the taxes, all those wealthy people who are investors are so happy to invest more money, they invest more money, the wheels of the economy spin faster and faster and faster and throw off more income than you gave up with the cuts. And how long would that take? Three years, he said. We'll have a balanced budget. Three years, he was off by $2 trillion, okay? Now, and so he had to raise taxes. Now, he raised taxes, $100 billion. President Bush, who said, read my lips, I'll never raise taxes, he had to raise taxes for the same reason and raise them on the rich. How much? About $90 billion. Then Clinton came and he said, we still have a leftover deficit in debt from those guys because they were promiscuous and profligate, et cetera, et cetera. And Bob Rubin says, you have to raise taxes on those rich people again. And so for the third time, we raised taxes on them. And what happened? Well, I gave you those numbers earlier. What happened after Reagan, Bush won, and Clinton raised taxes on that top 1%, the 16 best quarters the stock market ever had, the biggest surplus balance budget, of course, and then a surplus of $5.4 trillion after those tax increases. So what are you going to say to me now? R Mondale was right. 
There's no question Mondale was right. History says he's right. Well, then why do they get away with this argument? Because people don't understand the history. And if you explain this to the people, and we'll have an opportunity to do it, especially if the Democrats come together in consensus and get their act together and start now, because it's such an early start, thanks to Obama, you know, Hillary has come in now, now everybody's there. If they all got together and say, look, we're going to tell the truth on this issue, all of us, over and over and over again, and take back that money that we mistakenly gave to the rich people on the theory we didn't need it. We do need it. We need it desperately. We need it for education. We need it for health care. We need it for the military. We need it for all these things that I have mentioned to you. And it makes no sense at all not to take that money back. Well, if the Democrats start saying it, all of them as a chorus, all of them reading from the same book, and now we have a group called the Democracy Alliance that I spoke to about a month ago in Florida, they're raising $200 million. $200 million just to be able to help market issues like that one, where people are confused because they don't hear the whole thing. All they hear is somebody saying, he's going to raise your taxes. We're not going to raise your taxes. We're going to give you a tax cut. We're going to take that money back from the rich people. It'll be billions of dollars who don't need it and who shouldn't have gotten it in the first place, and give some of it to the middle class that'll spend it immediately because, as I pointed out to you, the cost of everything they need is growing faster than their income. Now, that's a good investment. You give them a tax cut, they'll spend the money. They spend the money. You give it to me, I'm not going to spend it. I'm just going to salt it away and call it an investment. You know, but they'll spend it because they need to, for a car or new clothes or to repair their roof. Now, that's where you're going to get the money, and that's a good place to get it. And then also you have to cut spending. Where will you cut spending? You have to cut spending in the entitlements. You have to spend Social secu Security and Medicare, but only for people who absolutely cannot be hurt by the cuts. You know, people like, like uh, the former head of Goldman Sachs, John Whitehead, stepped forward and said, what are you giving me Social Security for? Six, no, 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 700 billionaires and millionaires led by Gates and Buffett testified before the Congress and said, well, what are you talking about, you know, reducing our taxes, our state taxes, or these taxes, those taxes? We're the richest people in the world, and we particularly are the richest people in the United States of America, and we didn't do it because we're geniuses. I mean, the, the Gateses aren't superb uh, intellects who worked harder than anybody. We did it because we're Americans and we profited from the American way and the American government and the American protection and the American army and the American schools and the American workers. We owe to the country the taxes we're paying. And so we would have them as allies. And I told you before, when they did raise taxes on the wealthy, one of the results they got were more millionaires and billionaires than ever. Why? Because when you improve productivity by improving education and improving health care, the economy does get better. It does turn off profits. And who makes most of those profits? Those rich investors. And so in a way, when you took the money back from them, you reinvested it in America, and they were the first to profit from it. And so after all of that, after taxing those wealthy people, you produced more wealthy people than you had before. And it seems to me that's the answer. Now, for cutting, cut Social Security, Medicare, do what John McCain says, this corporate waste, you know, get rid of the corporate waste, do what Schumer says. He says if you had more auditors auditing the uh, returns, none of us likes to be audited, but if you had n more auditors and they deliberately don't get enough auditors, especially on the top, earners, but if you had more auditors, it would save billions of dollars, maybe hundreds of billions of dollars just in those audits. Let me conclude quickly. We were built by the insight and courage of people from all over the world who dared to do what was said to be undoable, and then they did it. They created the first successful experience in Republican democracy. They won a war of liberation against the British Empire that experts said could not be won. Then they courageously sustained their unique new democracy against economic calamities of all kinds and a series of wars, including a civil war that took 700,000 lives and that could have torn us in two, but didn't. And today, 
now we're faced with a new challenge. Either we'll accept our current condition as the best we're capable of. Either we have to say to ourselves tonight and uh, all the days and nights from now until 2008, well, look, you know, I'm doing all right. We're doing okay. America's the greatest in the world. Everybody concedes that. America is relatively the freest in the world. Everybody concedes that. Everybody wants to come here, and very few of us want to leave except to beat the taxes. And, and so, you know, let's not knock ourselves out. Let's not try too many of these things. Maybe if you try these things, maybe if you try to get all those 37 million people into the game, it's going to bump some of us out. I mean, you can take that attitude. And you can say, look, I, I don't want to mess around with that tax issue, Governor, because you know, they won't understand and they'll beat us the way they have beaten us every time we say we have to raise taxes. They'll never understand your distinction, Governor, because there's not enough time in a 28-second advertisement to deal with that. And they'll say, yeah, but you talk about collaborating with the rest of the world. I mean, why do we have to? Or why do we have to sit and listen to the Europeans and these other people? Um, we're strong enough. We're good enough. We can, we can do it for ourselves. You know, that's what Bush said, and he's wrong. President Kennedy's call to arms on space that I've mentioned now twice is frequently cited as an example of bold vision and daring leadership. And that's probably because there are so few relatively few comparable moments in our history. There are so few examples when our nation's leaders have taken the, the harder path instead of the politically cautious one. We're inclined, especially when we're leading the pack, we're inclined to be cautious as politicians. Even if we think it's right, we, we don't want to say it because they might misunderstand us. Well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't let that happen again in 2008. I don't think we can afford that kind of hyper-caution. The people who have ruled us for the last six years have given us not a bright new morning in America, but a sad kind of dusk. We have no excuse for not correcting that situation. We have the ideas, we have the resources, the question is do we have the will? And that will be up to you and to me and to the rest of the American voters to pick leaders who are competent but who have the will for the sake of the nation that we all love and for the sake of the world we live in. I pray that we make the right decisions, picking people who are competent but who have the boldness that our forefathers had. Thank you for your patience. Now let's have a real discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, until they uh, give us the hook, we'll have questions. Now, I, I told the uh, audiences at the 92nd Street Y over and over that I'm really terrific at uh, accepting questions. I'm a little weak on answers, but, but <laughs> questions, but I'm the easiest you'll ever find. So who has a question? Yes, sir. I think uh, we will not have to guess at that. I mean, the way that I, I believe that the American people this time around will not be seduced by charisma, I'll repeat what I said earlier, and are not going to be overly influenced by sex, one way or the other. Hillary's a woman. Uh, I think a lot of women are very happy about that. I'm happy about the fact that a woman may have a chance to win. We worked very hard in our governorship to advance women because they've been kept behind. But I don't think that's going to be a principal part of the decision making. Um, I don't believe race will stop Obama and I don't think race will make Obama a winner. I think people, uh, again, like overall the idea that an African American and that Richardson, who, reminds you he's a, an Hispanic. 
So now you have the first Hispanic, the first African American, the first woman. But, but those are all wonderful things, but I don't think they'll be determinants. If I'm right, and I hope I'm right, and I'll argue for this position over and over, the issues will determine it. See, the labels are a joke. But let's be honest. Liberal, mushy-headed liberal, conservative, compassionate conservative. What are you, Mr. President? I'm a compassionate conservative. What were you in Texas? Well, I was just a plain conservative. Oh. <laughs> Is compassionate conservative different than regular conservative? Well, yeah, we're more compassionate. Oh, all right. And what are you, Mr. Gore? I'm a new Democrat. What? What, uh, who are the old Democrats? Well, you're an old Democrat, Cuomo. What, yeah, okay. You mean I'm older than you are in years? No, no, you're like the previous generation of Democrats. Oh, and you're a new generation. Yeah, well, so what's the difference? Oh, um, well, I'm new Democrat, you know, and I have different positions. What different positions? Well, we make that up as we go along. It's all a game. You know, it really is all a game. So here's what you should do. Here's what you should do. Unfortunately, we can't. You know, we're stuck with party labels and over. Gen Look, there is a place for ideology, but it's not first place. Okay, first place should go to common sense and benign pragmatism, and you should be able to get things done. Here's the way we should pick candidates, and it's the way you do it at municipal elections in most places in the country, and that is on the basis of the issues. Where are you on Iraq? Where are you on the tax cut? Where are you on the health care? Please answer all of these questions. How do you feel about stem cells? How do you feel about the president saying, if I'm a believer in Christianity of my form, which says that life begins at conception, then you can't take an embryonic stem cell, even though it might be good for other people, because it's the taking of a human life. How do you know that, Mr. President? Well, because I'm a believer. I'm a true believer. Believer in what? In my religion. Oh, so, but, my, but I'm not in your religion, Mr. President. I'm not a true believer, and I want the stem cell. Well, that's too bad. I'm the president, and I'm religious, and you don't get the stem cell. And uh, so I, I, think, I think what we should do is, is check, hope that we get them dealing with the issues, that the difference between Edwards and Obama and Richardson and Biden and all the others and Hillary will be differences on the issues. Or in a really wonderful world, they would all agree on the big issues, you know, and then we could pick the most competent of them or the most attractive of them this or that way. So how will we know? The, the campaign will tell us. Another thing about the campaign. I'm also a great believer in, because I am a great believer in issues, as most of us here. That's why we're here today. We, we came here today to talk about the issues, not, not about the labels. But because we're that, I, I wish the, the process of selecting the candidates would change a little bit and that you'd have more debates, but real debates, not a debate that tests just your glibness and your memory or your sense of humor, where they give you a minute and a half to talk about Iraq. That's an insult. And that's why the 28-second commercials are an insult. They deal with tremendously complex issues. When you try to say them in 28 seconds, you're bound to distort. And so, in some places, they demand that if you're going to make a statement on television, it be at least five minutes long. Why? It's harder to be simplistic for five minutes. It's harder to be distorted for five minutes than it is to be distorted in 28 seconds. And so, uh, and, and you'll hear news of uh, a, a debate, free debate, that's going to be held at Cooper Union on February 28th. And I'm involved in it with Newt Gingrich is going to be announced, um, I guess, next week or one of these, by the Cooper Union people. And we're trying to get Cooper Union, which is where Lincoln made his great speech that made him president, we're trying to get that forum, uh, which is not a better forum than the 92nd Street Y, because there's nothing better than the 92nd Street Y. We know that. And that's especially true when you're standing in the 92nd Street Y <laughs> on a stage. But, but we, we should have more debates, more real debates, where, where the parties are given an opportunity to answer the question, even to refer to people who are there as aides. Because what you want to know is where you're going to be as a president on this issue, not how slick you are at remembering it and giving a one-and-a-half-minute uh, answer. 
So the answer to your question is how will we be able to tell the campaign will tell us where these people are in the issues and that's how we'll pick them. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the question is, uh, are you still part of the con uh, conversation? Uh, do you, uh, referring to me, have an opportunity to engage in? We all have an opportunity to engage in. I have a, a, a better opportunity than a lot of other people because I've been around for a while and because you know, there are people who ask me for my opinion. I just did a piece in USA Today, and I like USA Today because most people don't know this, but it sells more newspapers than any newspaper in America. And so more people get to read it. And I said in, in maybe four or five, six minutes of reading, everything I've said to you here today with all these words, only said it better and tighter. And, and got a lot of feedback on that. And uh, I'm regularly given the opportunity to travel around and speak. I told you I spoke to the Democracy Alliance, which is a n number of millionaires and billionaires, incidentally, uh, including George Soros and others who are raising money just to help get out a message or on progressive issues. And uh, I'll be doing that uh, in several places around the country. So yeah, look, I'm part of the conversation, not a big part of the conversation. Uh, to do that, you have to be a candidate. And uh, that's another thing about this election. We already have a number of very good candidates. And the conversation will start early and it will last longer. And so we have an opportunity to know more about the issues if we force them to stay on the issues. And we'll know who's playing too cautiously. Uh, we'll know which politicians say, well, you know, I'm going to be very, very, I don't want to make a mistake. And so even if Cuomo's right on that, I'm going to do a poll and see whether people understand, you know, these politicians who, who to get across troubled waters is one way I'd put it, troubled political waters, they'll take whatever safe stone. If the safe stone is on the right, they'll step to the right. If it's on the left, they'll step to the left. And that means they don't know where they're going to be when they get to the other side of the water. See, that, that kind of caution is, is not good. We'll be able to tell which of the candidates is like that because we're going to be asking the question, how are you going to get us out of Iraq? Now tell me, you said the president's wrong. You're right. He is wrong. Now you show me you're right. How are you going to get us out? How are you going to do the reconstruction? How are you going to keep the Shia and the Sunni talking? And then how are you going to battle the terrorism if it's ideological and you can't beat it with a bomb? How do you do that? Now be precise, be practical. What about the energy? Is Cuomo right or isn't he that energy and a change alternatives to what we now have, which is oil, con uh, considerable portion of it, Middle, Middle Eastern oil, Venezuelan oil, Chavez, uh, is he right that Finding an alternative to that is as important as getting first in space was in 1962. And you'll be able to get the answers. Um, so I'm looking forward to the season. Yes, here. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. The, the, there is a line in the speech, which I stopped reading because I hate reading my speeches. Um, they bore me, you know, and, and, and when they bore me, I know I'm not going to do well with you. So, but, but there's a line I wrote in the speech that, uh, in the energy section that talks specifically about a uh, global warming, and, and it refers to it this way, you know, it, it, Finding an alternative will also help us deal with what is every day becoming a more uh, you know, frighteningly accurate uh, description of an inconvenient truth, and that is global warming. And um, so the energy package as I present it is accommodative, if you will, of Gore's position in inconvenient truth. And for people who haven't seen that, incidentally, have you seen it's in, all of you? It's a wonderful, wonderful piece. Incidentally, incidentally, if Gore were a candidate, I think he would be very, very close to the top. Uh, if, if, I, I, don't see him being, I don't see him being a candidate. I don't see him coming in now that Hillary's in, and he'll probably stay out. Uh, that, in, in a way, is, is regrettable because he did win. 
the first time he tried. And it would have been nice. So I'm sorry I didn't mention it in, in the mini version, but if you want to read the ponderous version, I'll give it to you. <laughs> yes, anybody? Yes? Well, leadership would help, really, and, and that, th that's an interesting question because you do have a structure, and uh, Howard Dean now is the head of the Democratic structure. And all you need to do is to take Howard Dean, Harry Reid, who heads the Senate, has a majority, a slim one but has a majority, Nancy Pelosi, okay, and then get the candidates. And so if you put together a dozen people and got them to to sit down and get serious about creating consensus, it would be, first of all, a once in a lifetime. I don't, that's never happened to the best of my knowledge. And that's not because the logic of their remaining apart from one another and contentious with one another is so great that that's the best way to do it. It's, it's because that's the way it's always done. You know, they, you go on your own. Um, so I think it, it's possible to create a consensus if those people, those leaders, want a consensus. Certainly Nancy and Harry want them, because in order to get a bill passed, you have to get it passed through both houses. So the leader of the Senate and the leader of the, uh, the House of Representatives, they will want to work together, and they will work together very closely. The rest then becomes uh, a little more difficult. But it can be done. As to me, in the next um, 12 months, uh, I do do other things. I work for a living. I'm a lawyer. Uh, we have a special on wills. This, uh, <laughs> but, but, and and but but I, I I I am also <laughs> I'm also Wilkie Farr and Gallagher is the is the name of the firm. And uh, none of them are alive. <laughs> the, the firm is 117 years old, but it's by no means uh, obsolescent. The the uh, I'm going to do everything I can. Because I'm at a stage in my life where I, I had other opportunities to do other things. I had uh, an opportunity, I, I didn't reveal this, but uh, President Clinton did, to consider making myself a candidate for the Supreme Court of the United States and, and chose not to do that because I believe that the issues that I've been educated on by being 20 years in public service are so important and still so much up in the air and, and so, uh, so desperately need more articulation that I wanted to stay alive to do that. And um, in what's left of my lifetime, I want to be able to do more of that. So I'll be more active in this political campaign than I have been probably ever before. And I'll be all over the country. Yes, sir. Uh, we definitely are at risk. There's no question about that. If they did it once, they could certainly do it twice, three times. I mean, it, it, it was so easy. It's still so easy. I'm reluctant to mention all the things that they could do to us. And every time somebody does mention another one, like if they just dropped a small bomb on one of your nuclear power plants in New York, what would that do, et cetera, et cetera. So, of course, you're at risk. Uh, one wonders why it, uh, it hasn't happened again. Uh, it could very, very easily. And I don't think that there's anything that we've done that prevents them from doing it again. I think Homeland Security has been a joke as a new department. And, and look, this is what I said at the time. At the time when I think Joe Lieberman was the first to suggest it, that you should take all the FEMA, the uh, 
the, uh, that agency, this agency, put them all together and focus them uh, with a karate-like intensity on security. That simple logic was appealing, but it's unrealistic. Each of the agencies you jammed together had its own problems of managing itself. You put them together, you just multiplied the problems. And you saw that in Katrina. You took, you know, one of the best offices we had was the Federal Emergency Management Operation, FEMA. It worked beautifully. My son, when he was at um, uh, working for President Clinton as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, worked with them in catastrophes all over America. They were terrific, but they were jammed into Homeland Security and weren't able to operate correctly uh, in New Orleans. So we have a lot of work to do on Homeland Security. Well then, if we're not protected from 9-11 by virtue of our own conduct, why aren't they doing anything to us? I'm not sure. Um, nobody's sure. And they are not a nation or two leaders or four leaders. They are hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people all over the world who don't have any single leader and don't have a uniform. And they're Malaysian and they're this and they're, they're in Europe. You know, Europe is really frightened. But they're not, and let me stress this, I said it twice in the speech, I want to say it again because it's very important. There are a billion Muslims, and they're like Jews and Christians. They're religious people, and they're deists. I mean, they're, they believe in a god. They are not all bad people. The jihadists are Muslims, but they are heretical Muslims who took a part of the Koran and twisted it. All the other Muslims who are paying a price for them, because now, let's face it, the reality is if you're a Muslim, a lot of people look at you and say, oh, well, you know. And the, this sin of attribution, false attribution, it's, it's happened to all of us. If you're an Italian-American with a name that sounds like an oratorio, Mario Cuomo, you know, they can't resist if they talk about you politically saying, I wonder, you know, Mario Cuomo, I saw the Sopranos, his name sounds just like, you know, these guys. You know. And uh, that happens to you all the time, whether you're a Jew or you're black or you're a woman. You can't have a woman for president, why not? Well, once a month she'll be in trouble and who knows, you know. And so uh, let's remember that when we think about jihadism. Yes, ma'am. What if, um, yeah, I agree with you. What if the two weeks before the election, uh, in addition to the silly conventions you have, and the conventions are silly, they're exercises in political narcissism, you know. <laughs> uh, of a Democratic, first we had the Democratic convention for Kerry. And so what do you do? You stand up and the Democrats are 100% right and the Republicans are 100% wrong. Who says so? The Democrats. Uh, and, and they make fun of the Republicans, and, then, and they say good things about themselves, and everything is hyperbole and exaggerated and emotional, and, and it's, it serves a purpose, perhaps. But it, it's not, the purpose is not telling the whole truth, okay? And, uh, and they don't say things that they think might not be really popular, even though they think they're right. They won't say that. They're very cautious. Then you have the Republican convention that does the same thing from the other direction, okay? So you have two of these things. Neither of them are persuasive of anything, if you're intelligent. If instead of that, you had an unconventional convention, uh, and the unconventional convention, in addition to their conventions, would be one where you pick an audience that is as objective as you can get it, you know, Democrats, Republicans, people who call themselves that, and put them all in the audience. And then you have, over three days, a series of debates. But these are different debates. 
These are debates like one that I had with Ed Koch in 1982. And it was my idea, and I sold it to Rupert Murdoch. It was called a theater debate. And he said, well, what's a theater debate? I said, it'll be me and Ed on the stage, flip a coin. The guy who wins will, de will decide whether he wants to speak first or second. And then he'll start speaking. About what? Anything he wants to. And then the other guy will answer. Oh, that's going to be chaotic. It's not going to be chaotic. It's going to test him and I in a way, him and me, test me, objective case, in a way, in a way that normally is not done. Now you're testing his discretion, what issues he chooses to speak about, his graciousness, whether he allows you to speak, whether he interrupts you. And we had a debate that went that way, I don't know, for an hour and a half. Nobody had to pull us apart. Nobody had to say, you know, we had Roger Wood, who worked for Rupert Murdoch then at the Post, and he was in charge of relevance, you know, and what he would say every once in a while is, well, you guys have beaten that to death, can you move on to something else? And we did. Now, that's the kind of debate you should have. Now, here's what, and I did this with Larry King on the last night of the Republican convention. It was Al, Alan Simpson, one of my, maybe my favorite all-time Republican, especially since he's no longer in office, you know. <laughs> And, 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 and he and I debated five days in a row on Silicon Valley. And uh, the last day of the Republican convention, Larry King says, so what do you think of the Republican convention? And I said, well, it was as dumb as the Democratic convention, only it was better done than the Democratic, so they got more points with, than we did. It, it, Pataki, Jew. It's just ridiculous. And I told, gave him this idea about an unconventional convention. And Larry King says, that's very interesting. What do you say, Alan? He says, well, tell me again, Governor. He said, now, who would be in this thing? And I said, well, the first day we'd have like um, Colin Powell against uh, whoever you were going to use, uh, Kerry was going to use, and let's say it was Wes Clark, and, and he would uh, do it. And then we Rumsfeld against the Democratic counterpart and, uh, the, the, in the afternoon. Then the second day would have like Jon Snow against Robert Rubin, you know, on the economy. And they could talk for five minutes and everything. And then we'd have the vice presidential candidate, and then finally the president, and, the president, and they'd have an aide, and they'd have plenty of time, and it would be reasonable and everything. He says, well, I like that idea, but Jon Snow against Robert Rubin? He said, man, that's a snoozer, you know. <laughs> but, but I said, no, no, Rubin's terrific. So, so, but what about that? Wouldn't that be a good idea? Well, you go to CNN, you go to the networks, and you say, look, if that's what we did, would you carry it? And what they would have to say is, look, the first time, we sure would, because it's a brand new idea, and I'd love to see what the American people think of it, and you'd be able to tell, if you do it once, you know, how many people are watching, and how many people you lost, and how many people would just prefer to have their exercise in narcissism, you know, and listening to 28-second commercials. Um, and uh, you'd go to the networks, and if they said, yeah, we'll, we'll certainly cover it the first time, and if it bombs, then you won't do it again. And then you go to the leaders of both parties, and you talk to them, and you say, okay, you're the leader of the Democrat. They, they say no. Okay, we have it. Why? Listen, can I tell you, what is your name? <laughs> Sam? Sam. You know how long you just listened to me? <laughs> <laughs> people, now you're wrong. People will listen. They do listen. They listen on. So we're a lot of people. Look, we don't have enough people like the 92nd Street Y. Let me tell you a great story about the Y, the true story. This was the year after I lost the um, election. They called me up and they said, well, you have to come to the Y in January. He goes, January is always a slow month and maybe we can get some people. Yes. <laughs> And uh, no, he did. And I said, well, I don't want to come. I'm no longer the governor, and nobody's going to show up. And uh, he said, no, they'll show up. They remember you. You know, they feel sorry for you. Well, I had... <laughs> and so uh, reluctantly, <laughs> reluctantly, this actually happened. Reluctantly, I said, all right, again. And they gave me a date. I didn't tell my wife. I didn't tell anybody at the office. And, and I just I wasn't looking forward to it. And the day came, and it rained. Uh, I said, oh, gosh, now it's raining. And I said, well, OK, let me bite the bullet, and I, I'll go, and I'll give him my shtick and see what happens. So I get in the cab in front of the Y, and here are a lot of 
people going kind of little with the umbrellas, you know, and they're walking through the rain, and a nice crowd. And I said, oh, this is terrific. So I, instead of going to the stage entrance, I said, let me out here. I'm going to go in with them, you know, and talk because they're coming to hear me. And so I went in. And a little guy, a <laughs> little man that was walking in front of me, he got in, he shook his umbrella, he took off his hat. I don't know why his hat was wet. He had an umbrella, but he shook his hat, you know. And, and then he looked up at me, and I looked uh, down at him, and I said, this is wonderful with all this rain and I mean, people coming here. He says, oh, I wouldn't miss it for anything. And uh, he says, I have a book here. I come to all the lectures. I said, terrific. Uh, he says, who's speaking tonight? <laughs> now, this is true. <laughs> that was true. And this is the truth. Now, there's a picture of me up on the wall, see, and I, and I looked down at him and I said, Mario Cuomo he says, I heard him. He's pretty good. <laughs> you know, probably, now, that's, that's the 92nd Street Y. So you have people. So you have people who are in. We do have people who are interested. Uh, and I, look, I think, honestly, if you could get the whole United States of America to listen one night, and you said to them, look, I'm sick and tired of labels. You know, forget these phony labels, this Democrat. Well, let's talk to you. Ninety percent would say you're right. I think this country is much closer to being independent than it is to being Republican or Democrat. I think the Republicans and Democrats won't say that. You know, most of them won't say it because you're old-fashioned and I don't want to get into the argument. I mean, if I start saying, well, I don't want to call myself a Democrat anymore and to be a, well, it raises too many questions. But deep in their heart and firmly fixed in their mind, I think, is the idea that it makes more sense to judge people on their issues, on their specific answer to specific questions, than to have this presumption about how they would handle problems on the basis of what they call themselves with a, a silly label, or whether they wear it a donkey or an elephant. Uh, and the, Republicans never say donkey, they say jackass, you know, and uh, <laughs> so that's it. I think you're wrong, Sam. I hope we get a chance to prove that you're wrong, too. Yeah. Yes, good. Yes, sir. I think uh, I, I have faith in them. Uh, I don't have faith in the people who fooled them, including us, the Democrats, because we voted with the president. So we were fooled. The president was fooled. The president was fooled. Either the president was fooled or he lied. I don't believe he lied. I don't believe he deliberately lied. Uh, I do believe he, he was obviously wrong. He was obviously fooled. Powell was fooled. Powell did not lie. Powell was fooled. Uh, and so, how can you blame the public? They listen to Powell, they listen to the president, and then the Democrats get up and say, we agree with the president, and what did you want them to say? The Democrats are wrong, the Republicans are wrong, everybody's wrong but me. You see, so, I, I'm not, I, I fault the system, but I'm not gonna fault the people. I think the people, ideally, ideally, if you had experience with juries, ideally, forget about O.J. Simpson and a few of the um, uh, exceptions to this, but if you have a jury and you lock them up and they're 12 people or five people, whatever the number is, and you've gone through the process of assuring yourself as to their objectivity, and it's a pretty good process, and if you keep them away from, from pollutants like newspapers and other people whispering to them information. If you keep them pure in that they have to listen only to the evidence in the room, and the evidence then gets tested by a judge for its probity and for its appropriateness. If you do all of that, that jury, that American jury of Con Edison people, a former school teacher, bus driver, a retired executive, they are amazingly good at making intelligent judgments. The difficulty is that with the political process, you don't have those corrections of polluting material. And so all sorts of irrelevancy, all sorts of lies come at them from all directions. And that's the process. 
Now there are things we could do that we're reluctant to do for practical reasons. Ban 28 second commercials. The networks will go crazy, see? You know, make them five minute per, take, do, do the kind of debate I'm talking about. You could do that very easily. Um, insist on the money that comes from taxpayers being spent in a certain way. Uh, I'm going to give you taxpayer money. We do it in the city. The state should have a system like the cities. And, and, and federally, we, of course, give a lot of money. Uh, that's taxpayer money. That money should be spent on debates. It should be spent on your writing 1,000-word essays on these subjects, etc. Just control the way your money is spent to make the system better. It can be done if you really want to do it. One last question. Yes, ma'am, with the red sweater. What I just said is one of the things you should do about it. I mean, uh, Buckley against Valio is a case that says that you are entitled to spend whatever money of your own that you want. And so if you want to spend $75 million to be mayor, you can. And if you want to spend a uh, uh, billion dollars to be president, you can. That's an unfortunate conclusion. I can see how they got there constitutionally, but it's unfortunate that they said that. If they could change that, it would be a lot easier. If you could stop people from spending their own money, you know, it would be easier to control this situation. But in the end, everything we've tried has failed. Everything we tried has failed. Um, so I, I don't think you're going to be able to improve it by regulating the finances. I think you can improve it by doing some of the little things that we're talking about here. Having better debates, having an unconventional convention, uh, limiting 28-second commercials. See, if you had two honest parties, Democrat and Republican, and they got together and said, let's make rules, nothing can stop them from making their own rules and say, look, in the name of objectivity, let's ban 28 seconds, let's, let's, let's both do the same things. It could happen, but it all takes leadership, John Kennedy-type leadership, the space speech-type leadership. That's what we have to look for in this campaign, is a president who can give us that kind of leadership and a Congress who can follow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you.